Good morning from the 17 studios. I'm Alex Fisher and we are breaking into regularly scheduled programming to bring you the latest on the coronavirus crisis here in Kern County. This morning we learned that 72 more people have contracted the virus. Those are new cases. Uh, the good news is that no new deaths were reported. Now it is important to note that that does not necessarily mean that people that no one died within the last 24 hours. Uh, sometimes it takes longer to confirm a, a, a death and that is why sometimes it takes that uh, we, we see these days where we will go several days without any reported deaths. So again, uh, no new deaths were reported today, though. That is the good news. Uh, we are again waiting for our county officials to give us an update on the coronavirus pandemic. As you know, uh, one of the topics of uh, concern is whether or not we are going to be able to go into the next tier, the lower tier, and that would allow more businesses and even schools to reopen. So that is something that a lot of our county officials have been talking about. And they even sent our board of supervisors, sent a letter to the governor, an official letter, talking about their concerns over this new tier system and how Kern County is being measured. So this is a topic that a lot of our county officials have been paying close attention to. And they are sure to be talking about that uh, in just a few moments as we wait for them uh, to come up. Uh, again, let's just go over the numbers that we know so far that 31,148 people have tested positive for coronavirus since the beginning of this pandemic back in March, 72 new cases today. More than 15,000 people have recovered from the virus and there's about more than 3,000, additional 3,000 people that are presumed to have recovered. So that is definitely good news, uh, seeing so many people that have recovered from this virus. Again, our death toll stands at 340 and uh, that is uh, with most of those deaths happening in July and August, August being our deadliest month after we saw that spike in coronavirus cases in July, right after the 4th of July holiday. Uh, right now we do know uh, that our hospitalization rate which is good news that it is declining. We know that 142 people are currently in the hospital. That's up just a few patients from where we were yesterday, uh, but still relatively low from where we were a couple of weeks ago. And that number, the 142, shows you that uh, we have not seen our hospitalizations be that low uh, since uh, about late May, early June. So that is good news is that again, we're starting to see a decline in those hospitalizations, uh, but still, uh, still high with 142 people in the hospital. At one point though, it was over 300. So you can see that we are considerably lower than where we have been, which is good news. Let's uh, talk about the cases and break it down by ages. Uh, we the the largest age group, the group between 18 and 49 years old, uh, has 19,358 cases. 5,555 cases are uh, between the ages of 50 and 64 years old. And uh, for the group that is 65 and older, we have 2,600. And 45, and then for our children, zero to 17, there are 3,552 cases uh, in Kern County regarding our uh, children population. Breaking it down by sex, uh, there are 16,301 cases uh, that are women, and 14,846 cases that are men. Now, one of the things that we have been talking about over the last several months is how this is disproportionately uh, in, in, impacted our uh, Hispanic population with 52% of cases being uh, Hispanic in our Hispanic population, but nearly 60% of the deaths. So you can see how that has uh, very much impacted our Hispanic community. Once again, we are waiting on our county officials to give us an update on the coronavirus crisis here in Kern County. They meet once a week to give us an update on how our county is responding to this crisis. It's usually uh, this update happens on Thursdays. And uh, but lately the conversation has really been focused on how our county is going to reopen. As you know, a couple of weeks ago at the beginning of this month, uh, Governor Gavin Newsom changed and the State Department of Public Health changed our reopening guidelines, if you will, that allow us to uh, modify how we can slowly get back to normal. There are several tiers. We currently are in the worst tier, the purple tier, which indicates that the coronavirus is widespread in our community. 
And that, of course, has the most restrictions on uh, for us and uh, several other counties, d dozens of counties in California. The goal is to move into the next tier, which is the red tier. That would allow some restrictions to be modified and allow some businesses to reopen, if you will. As you know, a lot of our businesses, is primarily restaurants, cannot allow indoor dining right now. If we are able to get into the, ne the next tier, then the restaurants could open up a little bit. That's just one of the guidelines there. Uh, that also allows some businesses uh, to also open up to a smaller capacity. And it also allows our schools to open up to a smaller capacity as well. So there are some uh, guidelines that can be relaxed with if and when we go into the, ne the next tier. So uh, that, of course, is something that we'll have to wait for. It does take a lot of time for us to get into those, those tiers, uh, depending on how we are doing in uh, Kern County with the spread of coronavirus. But that is something that our county officials want more clarity on. They think that we're doing a very good job at testing and uh, having plenty of testing sites in Kern County, uh, which allows as many people to go and get a free coronavirus test, whether or not you're showing symptoms of coronavirus. But our, uh, and they're concerned that our uh, state is modifying the numbers, uh, which would put us into a more, to be more uh, restrictive category. Again, once I, uh, I said that our county leaders are getting prepared to speak, uh, let's take you live to our uh, county chambers. And this is Megan Pearson, the county administrative officer's uh, uh, public information officer. And uh, let's go right to the news conference. Good morning. Uh, this morning we are reporting 72 new COVID-19 cases in Kern County residents and no additional deaths. I want to talk briefly about the state's new monitoring program. We've, we've spoken about this uh, somewhat earlier, but just to review, the state made changes so that now we have four different tiers with corresponding colors. They are, the state is measuring case rate and percent positivity to determine how the counties, and in, in particular Kern County, is doing in our efforts to battle COVID-19. Um, the case rate is the average number of new daily cases um, averaged over seven days with a set seven day lag. And percent positivity is, the, is averaged over seven days with a seven day lag. The case rate, in order for us to meet the red tier, tier two, or for us to move down a tier so that we can open up additional businesses and potentially schools, the red tier, we have to be below a case rate of seven. Our unadjusted case rate as of Tuesday is 6.7. So that's good. We're below the case rate uh, and that puts us at least initially in the red tier. The testing positivity needs to be below 8% and it is 7.1% as of Tuesday. Uh, as we've spoken before, however, the state is now looking at the number of tests that we perform on a daily basis and then we are compared against the state average. Because the state has indicated that our average testing rate is lower than the state average testing rate, they are artificially augmenting our case rate and increasing it from 6.7 to 7.5. That puts us back into the purple tier. The state runs these numbers uh, every Tuesday and publishes it on their website. And we obviously track that very closely. In order for us to progress to the red tier, we have to meet that criteria for 14 consecutive days. At such time, then we can progress into tier two or the red tier. The state has also made mention of a additional metric, the health equity metric. This is still in draft form. We've had a couple discussions with the state about this new metric. 
This metric is going to compare um, census tracts within the county and compare census tracts that have a high testing positivity to those that have a low testing positivity. And the state is going to mandate that we make improvements going forward so that we try to address that high positivity rate in some census tracts and bring that rate down. This is still in draft form. They have not released the document publicly yet, but from what we understand, once it's released, we will have six weeks to make a 10% reduction in that difference in order for us to move, to progress within tiers. So there'll be more details coming out about the specifics on this. The summary is the state is asking us to look throughout the county for areas that have higher rates of testing positivity and to try to address that by um, throwing additional resources in those communities to try to bring that down. And within six weeks, we need to show improvement to allow us to, uh, to continue to progress through the tiers. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ryan. Thank you. Good morning. I appreciate that, Matt. Um, before I, I get started uh, with uh, COVID, a little non-traditional, we don't really talk about uh, things unrelated to COVID at these press conferences, but I'm going to make an exception to talk about uh, 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 Kenneth Twisselman. On Monday, uh, Kern County lost a local ranching legend and cattle industry giant, uh, Kenneth Twisselman. The real deal. Uh, Mr. Twisselman was not just a cattleman, he was a farmer, res uh, respected businessman, longtime school board member and patron of the arts. He was a kind, generous and humble man, and he'll be remembered for his contributions to our community, his leadership in the cattle industry, and really what makes Kern County so special and unique. And we send our best wishes to uh, Mr. Twisselman's family and particularly his wife of 68 years, Rosemary. Now on to COVID. Uh, today, we've tested 184,000 uh, people in our community to date. 31,148 positive tests to date. Of those who've tested positive to date, 30,666 or 98% have either fully recovered or are presumed recovered. Uh, or are isolating and recovering at home, treating their symptoms on their own. Today we have 142 people receiving uh, some form of care uh, in area hospitals. A uh, few comments on the Board of Supervisors. Uh, they, uh, this past Tuesday there were a number of uh, things taken up by the Board, actions related uh, to COVID-19. Tuesday, the board used uh, or approved the use of uh, uh, $1 million in federal CARES Act funding uh, for a program called the uh, Housing to Harvest uh, program. Uh, they also authorized in that same agenda item an agreement with the Community Action Partnership of Kern or CAPK uh, to serve as our local administrator uh, for this program. The program is designed to provide temporary hotel options. Uh, housing options for essential farm and food processing workers who are either COVID-19 positive and are not requiring a stay in an area hospital uh, or who were exposed to the virus. The program provides safe and suitable places to isolate uh, to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 among these workers, their households, and our community overall. The program falls in line uh, with the governor's blueprint for a safer economy uh, to identify a plan for potential risk areas in an effort to reduce case transmission, uh, reduce overall testing positivity rates, and allow the county to move more quickly uh, to advance to a lower tier uh, in this blueprint that has been provided by the governor, allowing increased business and school reopening. Importantly, this program will provide additional outreach to these workers uh, as well as testing. 
The Board of Supervisors also on Tuesday approved an MOU with the City of Bakersfield, uh, which allocates additional funding uh, to the Kern Recovers Program. The City of Bakersfield is providing an additional $3 million in forgivable loan assistance for small businesses located within the Bakersfield city limits and an additional $2 million in grant funding to nonprofits that are located in the Bakersfield metro area. I want to thank uh, the city of Bakersfield and their leadership uh, for providing this additional funding. It's meaningful value added and it is appreciated I know by uh, area small businesses and it's, uh, we, we are honored to partner with them uh, to make this happen. Uh, we urge small businesses interested in financial assistance, if you've not already uh, been given uh, that financial assistance by the county, if you are in the Bakersfield city limits, you can go to kerncounty.com uh, to apply, see details on this uh, program and apply for some assistance. Same with nonprofits. If you are a nonprofit anywhere in Kern County, uh, we have uh, financial assistance through a grant program available to you now. Uh, we encourage, if you are a nonprofit, please visit kerncounty.com uh, to see details on how you may apply and receive a grant. Also Tuesday, uh, the board made a referral to my office to bring back a resolution that they will consider sending to California Governor Gavin Newsom, demanding greater clarity, consistency, and continuity in his directives uh, to our county our business community, and our residents related to COVID-19. This resolution has been drafted and the board will consider it next Tuesday, September 22nd. The catalyst for the board's referral to my office on this resolution is the governor's recently announced blueprint for a safer economy and changes that have been made subsequent to the announcement of that blueprint, which was made on August 28th. The, this blueprint uh, originally and specifically required California's counties to meet stated and simple benchmarks in overall case rates and testing positivity rates in order to move into less restrictive tiers that would allow for a measured reopening of businesses, schools, and other activities in our community. On Monday, September 7th, Governor Newsom announced an adjustment to his blueprint uh, now including a benchmark on overall testing rate, testing rates. As an added criteria, California counties must meet for the measured reopening of businesses, schools, and other activities. At issue here, Governor Newsom is now arbitrarily inflating overall case rate numbers in those counties who have an overall testing rate below the statewide average, further slowing and complicating a county's move into a less restrictive tier. The statewide testing rate average is a moving target and is not based on any clinically relevant data or information. This new criteria unnecessarily burdens our residents, parents, and children further slowing business and school reopening, and it unnecessarily and arbitrarily penalizes counties who have little to no control over voluntary and individual decision-making related to testing for COVID-19. Governor Newsom's emphasis on increasing overall testing rates and the new benchmark on overall testing rates, he's ordering California counties to now meet in order to allow businesses and schools to reopen, also seem to conflict with Center for Disease Control directives on testing. Demonstrative of these new requirements on testing rates and their direct tie to when and how businesses, schools, and other activities in our community may open more widely. On Tuesday, the Board of Supervisors unanimously approved an emergency item brought forward by my office that encourages county employees to get tested multiple times between now and the end of the year voluntarily. The governor is now requiring overall testing rates as a condition for businesses to reopen, then we will adapt and do everything that we can as an employer uh, to help our county 
uh, get into less restrictive tiers of his blueprint. We have some ability to do this with our own employees, uh, much less of an ability to do this uh, everywhere else, which is a source of, uh, has been a source of our frustration here. Um, lastly, I want to make a couple of comments uh, about some information uh, that uh, uh, we just learned about uh, that is uh, equally frustrating, if not more, uh, for us. Uh, there are 8,600 tests uh, that are not being counted by the state and not being included in our county's overall uh, testing numbers by the state. Uh, these tests are associated with the federal testing site that has been in Kern County. Uh, as you're aware, it was at the fairgrounds for some weeks. Uh, we have uh, that, that once they left the fairgrounds, this, this federal testing site became a mobile testing site where it is being moved around the county to make sure that we are testing as many people as possible. In fact, we have been out at Edwards Air Force Base uh, for the last two weeks uh, testing personnel uh, on that base. And uh, uh, we'll be using this federal testing site going forward in an effort to meet the governor's new requirements on testing. Uh, we need to have assurances and confidence in the fact that the state is accurately reflecting our community's hard work on testing. Uh, we do not have that confidence today. Uh, the the 8,600 tests that are not being included uh, that were done by our federal partners uh, is uh, frankly unacceptable. Uh, these thousands of tests being done in our community by our federal partners, they're not being counted. And it's mind-boggling uh, that the governor's own people uh, who are involved in supporting and promoting uh, these testing sites, this federal testing site, um, it's mind-boggling that they're involved in the way that they are, yet those numbers are not being reflected accurately in data being published by the California Department of Public Health. Governor, we're asking you, uh, we are urged, strongly urging you to intervene uh, and fix this problem immediately. Uh, so that the testing that we are doing locally is accurately reflected in the data that you're collecting. This is important because you are holding us accountable to increase overall testing rates in our community. And you are tying those overall testing rate numbers to how we're able to move through your blueprint so that we can open in a measured, safe, and responsible way more businesses, our schools, and other activities. So we're planning on working uh, with the governor and his staff in the hours and days ahead to make sure this problem is addressed. It's important uh, that it gets addressed because we will be using this mobile testing site in this community for weeks to come. We'll be moving it around, uh, strategically positioning it to maximize uh, uh, people's, uh, optimize people's ability to go and get tested uh, in, a, in an easy way, so it is done easily. Uh, testing rates are important. Governor, you have stated that. That is part of your blueprint. Please intervene and fix this problem so that, uh, that we, we can have assurances that these numbers are being counted accurately. Uh, with that, I will hand it back to Megan for questions. Thank you, Ryan. Okay, as we typically do, we're gonna go down our list that was shared with the media outlets. Uh, remember, it is star six to unmute. Um, and a quick reminder as well, that we ask each outlet to ask their initial question and that we will come back at the end for second and follow-up questions. So if you could limit it in the beginning, that's helpful to your other media partners who have other assignments to get to. So starting at the top of the list, based on who is dialed in, we have Austin with Channel 23. Do you have any questions? Yeah, hi there, guys. Thanks. Wondering if uh, there could be some clarification on why um, the state is not including those uh, numbers from the federal testing site uh, as far as the metrics occurring locally. 
Thanks, Austin. Uh, we're going to have Kim Hernandez, our lead epidemiologist, respond to your question. Good morning, Austin. Thank you for your question. Um, so what happens in the process where the state is counting the um, number of tests that are coming through is that they are counting all of the ones that are submitted to us electronically. The, the federal testing site, the surge site, is still submitting everything manually, so they are sending us faxed reports of all of them. And so they get entered into the system, um, because, but because they're not automatic, um, the state has not been counting them at this time. We're continuing to work with them to get those set up um, so that it will come through uh, the expected process of coming through electronically and that it can be then counted up by the state. Thank you, Kimberly. Okay, your next outlet that we have dialed in is the Mojave Desert News. I believe we have Jack on the line. Do you have any questions? Okay, we'll go to the next outlet. Uh, I'm just going to check uh, and see if we have Mountain Enterprise on the line. Our next outlet is Valley Public Radio. I believe we have Carrie on the line. Hi, thank you. Um, yes, I wanted to follow up on that with um, with Kim. Just on these tests, so so these are not so they're they're entered manually, but presumably they still go into an electronic system, right? So is it just that it's the wrong kind of system? I guess yeah. I guess if you could still offer some more clarity on. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously, I know that this is the, you know, maybe you don't understand everything happening at the governor's level. You obviously don't agree with it. But yeah, just a little more clarity on, on why, that, why that would matter. We'll have Kim respond. Thanks, Carrie. Hi, Carrie. Thanks. Um, the state has to go through every test in the state of California. Um, and so the electronic process, um, when things are submitted electronically, it allows uh, it to have a uniform process. There are some things called HL7 messaging that our labs use um, so that everything comes through in the same way with the same um, values and elements so that when they're doing all of that data processing at the state level um, that they don't have to go and pick through each individual record to make sure that it fits the criteria it's supposed to. Um, so the electronic lab reporting is something um, that is it makes it a little bit more efficient for them to be able to um, assess all of these numbers quickly for us um, so that they can report it. And so uh, currently when it's entered in manually, it gets into that CalReady system that we talk about. It gets to us at Public Health so we can investigate it. Um, but because it's all entered manually and it's subject to things like the typos um, and sort of inconsistency um, that doesn't fit the same boxes that the electronic laboratory reports come through, um, it doesn't currently get counted in, in the state's um, the state's process for evaluating all of those metrics. Okay, thank you. Hi, I wanted to follow up with uh, on what Kim said. Uh, th this is why people um, really like government. Uh, you know, uh, what we're asking, I don't think the governor knows about this, um, to be fair. Um, we want him to know about it and we want him to do something about it. We want it fixed. Uh, this is uh, completely unacceptable. Uh, it, is, it is unfair um, to our residents, our businesses, our schools, uh, the, the, the way that uh, overall testing rates are now being calculated. It's unfair uh, to all of the people working so hard uh, on our staff here at the county, uh, the people from the EOC, that are, that are managing uh, testing sites. It's unfair to the, o, the state OES employees who are managing. It's unfair to the federal employees who are here uh, doing all this work. This needs to get fixed. Um, I believe it's an easy fix, and uh, we, are, we are asking the governor to, uh, to look into it, engage with his staff, and to uh, order that this get fixed immediately, uh, given the, uh, the importance being placed on testing. Our next outlet is Channel 20 line, 29. I believe we have Emily Irwin on the line. Hi. So I was wondering, um, so some people in the community and even some schools have sent communication home that they have optimism that the county might be able to move into the red tier in the next, as soon as the next 
two weeks. Um, but with this new ec health equity metric, I don't know if that's possible. I'm wondering where public health stands on that and what their estimate is for when we might be able to move out of this most restrictive tier. I think Ryan's going to respond to your question, Emily. Great. Thanks for the question, Emily. Um, we'll say that uh, we are optimistic. Uh, we're working very hard. Our numbers are going down. We're flattening the curve and our case rate, overall case rate and overall testing positivity rate numbers uh, are going down. Uh, we, uh, we are faced with, um, with this adjustment that is being made on case rate due to our overall, tied into our overall uh, testing rate. I know this is complicated, uh, but we, uh, we're on a good track. We're working hard and we are optimistic. Um, and I think that the community uh, should, should be optimistic too. And I think that it should be a sign that what it is that they are doing uh, to help uh, manage the spread, slow the spread, flatten the curve is working. All the uh, public health best practices that individuals, businesses, uh, people in this community are practicing uh, are having an impact. Uh, we don't have a date um, on, uh, on any of this when we think we'll move into the next tier. Uh, but uh, to answer your question, we are uh, uh, pleased with our progress. We're pleased with where we are. And uh, we are uh, working very, very hard uh, to move this county, as, as demonstrated by uh, a lot the, the things that were said here today, uh, working very hard to uh, get us into a position to move into um, the red tier. I will say with regard to the various changes that have been made subsequent to the, the governor's announcement of his plan on the 28th, there have been several changes uh, over the last couple of weeks. Um, the, the overall um, requirement on testing rate, uh, which we talked about, which is at issue with this data glitch that's happening between the federal lab and, and, the, and the state public health group, um, the, uh, the testing rate is a much more challenging um, criteria. Uh, for us to meet, um, this is you know requiring in order to in order to get to the state average, we're talking about six to seven hundred additional tests that need to be done every day uh, in a sustained way going forward. It's a much more challenging metric, uh, which is why we're spending so much time on it. Uh, it is it is it is the number one issue that we have uh, with the governor's recent changes, and that's where we're going to continue to keep our focus. Our next outlet is Channel 17. I believe we have Aton on the line. Yes, good morning, everybody. And, and it's on that last note that uh, Ryan was talking about that uh, brings me to my question on Tuesday. Uh, Matt Constantine said 607 tests per day would be needed in order for the state to stop artificially inflating the numbers. Uh, so with this latest announcement from Ryan just now about the 8,600 tests that are not being uh, approved or not being accounted by the state, if they do count the 8,600 tests, then as far as you know, will we not need to do 607 more tests every day? Thanks for the question, Eitan. Uh We're going to have Kim respond, and I think, yeah, sorry, we'll have Kim respond. Uh, good morning. So we are going to continue to work to get those older cases um, into the system electronically, uh, but all of the metrics that come from the state move forward. Um, and so even when those get plugged back in, they're not going to go back and say three weeks ago, you know, this was your old case rate. Um, so we are trying to work on it now so that for the next assessment um, it will be included in their calculations uh, because we, we want to make sure that it is accurately reflecting what's going on in our community. Um, so it's something where it's uh, moving forward um, is what you know, where the correction will help us. Um, we don't think there's um, any way for them to take the, the information that gets backfilled and to adjust any stuff in the past because we're moving on um, to where are we now and where can we be in the next few weeks. All right, thank you. 
Our next outlet is KUZZ. I believe we have Rob King on the line. Yeah, hi, Megan. Um, my question is, is there a plan in place or a strategy being discussed in order to get more regular residents of Kern County in to get tested? We'll have Ryan respond, Rob. Yes, uh, there is. Um, you, you saw part of that plan exercised and implemented uh, at the Board of Supervisors meeting um, Tuesday. Uh, obviously, the county has, uh, we're, we're the largest workforce uh, here in this region, you know, over 8,000 employees. Um, we're uh, making sure that uh, we uh, get our own house in order and uh, are encouraging as many of our employees voluntarily uh, to go and, uh, and get tested. Uh, we believe that could have a uh, significant impact on our testing rates. We're encouraging other um, uh, uh, local governments uh, across Kern County, school districts, uh, cities, uh, to consider uh, doing, uh, taking similar actions. Um, obviously, uh, to, to Matt's point, in, um, in communities that are at high risk, um, in disadvantaged areas, um, you know, groups like our uh, task force that was put together uh, to um, help us navigate through and address issues in our Latino community. Um, that is going to, um, uh, I think, bear fruit and um, play a significant role in increasing testing there. Obviously, our Housing to Harvest program um, is, uh, uh, you know, part of that. There's, there's testing involved with that uh, and isolating uh, up to uh, just under 600 individuals uh, through this program. Uh, there are a number of things we'll be doing, obviously, communication-wise. Uh, we, uh, you know, in, in terms of if you get away from testing and you want to talk about getting positivity rates uh, down, not only overall, but in uh, certain uh, high-risk uh, areas and communities uh, in, our, uh, in our county, um, we've, we've We've distributed thousands, tens of thousands of uh, free um, PPE uh, through our um, distribution program, Kern Recovers. Um, we're use, utilizing CAP-K uh, to, uh, to get uh, masks and gloves and, and sanitizing equipment and things uh, into the hands of people that may not uh, have the ability um, to, to get that or afford it. Uh, that program has been quite successful. It's not just going to disadvantage individuals and, and communities, uh, you know, in the form of masks, gloves, et cetera, but we are also uh, providing thousands and thousands and thousands of this equipment to our small business community uh, across a number of different industries. Um, and I, at last count, I think we were impacting about 50,000 employees of those businesses who have taken part in the program. So, uh, so yes, we are uh, not, uh, not only uh, exercising um, today uh, toward, you know, fo focusing on getting testing rates up, uh, but we'll be uh, planning um, in the days and, and weeks ahead on how we might be able to do that better. Keep, you know, keep in mind, this is a voluntary action, individual action. Uh, we cannot force people to go get tests. Uh, we can only convey to folks that the governor is now holding uh, our businesses and our schools and all of the reopening and the activities from just a measured reopening, not a full reopening, but a, but a measured reopening through tiers. He is holding us accountable for uh, overall testing rates. And so uh, if you would like to be helpful in getting us uh, moving through these tiers in a, in a, in a, in a, at a quicker pace, uh, then we would ask you to, to go get tested at any number of the testing sites that we have uh, here throughout, uh, throughout Kern County. And all of that information can be found online at kerncounty.com. Okay, thank you. Our last dial is the Bakersfield, California, and I believe we have Sam Morgan on the line. Yes, Megan, hello. Um, my question just has to do with the 
low numbers of tests that are taking place in Kern County. Obviously, the announcements every day from the Public Health Department have shown that fewer people are coming up back with positive tests for coronavirus. And I'm wondering, with the lower amount of tests that p people are getting in the community, does that mean that we could be missing some cases out there and that there could be more people um, that have coronavirus that we just don't know about? And does that put people at a greater risk for, for getting it uh, compared to back when we were getting like hundreds and hundreds every day that were coming back with positive uh, results. Thanks for the question, Sam. Let me just make sure I, ca I understand what your question is so we can pass it off. You're asking if the lower number of tests being performed now is actually putting us at a greater risk for not catching those positive COVID patients? Yeah, that's essentially it. Okay. We'll have Kim respond. Hi, Sam. So, um, we are seeing fewer cases in our community. Um, we're seeing this throughout the state of California that in many counties um, the case rate is going down. We are hopeful that this is a true representation of what's in our community. Uh, we do continue to encourage people who have symptoms to contact their health care provider and to be assessed about whether or not they need testing. Um, we know that the testing volume uh, tends to reflect um, and the case rate tends to reflect what's what's going on and the perception people have um, and we are hopeful that we are still um, able to get all of the people who need testing tested. We have testing capacity and that's sort of a very important piece to make sure that it is widely available in our community um, and that we it is accessible to people in our community um, so that they can go and get tested if they feel the need. If they've talked to their health care provider or if they are having um, symptoms that might be COVID, um, if they have concerns about um, being in close contact with someone, if they have concerns after traveling. Um, and so we are hopeful that it is reflective of what's truly in our community. Um, we know that there is always some risk um, of missing a people here and there and those few people if they don't get tested and they don't know that they're positive and they don't isolate at home can transmit to other people. So we want to make sure that our community knows that it is widely available. Um, they can go online to the county website to look for the testing sites. They can contact their health care providers. A number of our health care providers um, are testing um, on site at their offices um, and so we are hopeful that we continue to encourage people if they have concerns about COVID-19 to reach out um, to get tested so we can evaluate their situation and that if they are indeed positive they'll know that they need to stay home that they can talk to us at public health so we can help identify um, any others who might have been exposed so those people can stay home and quarantine um, so that we can limit transmission in our community. If we can continue to do those things, we hope to continue to see the case rate go down because we hope to be interrupting transmission in our community um, so we don't spread it any further. Thank you, Kim. Okay, I'm going to go through the outlets one more time just to make sure we catch any follow-up questions. Back up at the top, channel 23, Austin, any follow-up? Hi there, yeah. Um, the new census tract metric that you guys were talking about, um, is this another potential setback for the county? Thanks, Austin. We're going to have Matt respond. Give us one second. Okay. Austin, uh, good morning. Um, the health equity metric that the state has yet to release does add another component to uh, our efforts but really the main focus here is the number of people that we can test to try to remove that case adjustment. Uh, we'll yet to kind of see what the health equity metric does. Uh, once implemented, there'll be a six week delay, it sounds like. They're still refining it based on comments. So right now our focus is on meeting those current metrics, getting our testing positivity down, getting our number of tests up, and getting the number of the case rates down. So that's really what's driving all of our efforts so that we can then uh, try to get our businesses and schools back open. Does that answer your question, Austin? Yes, it does. Thanks, Matt. I had a, another follow-up from last week. Uh, there was some frustration, obviously, last week uh, toward the state regarding 
the artificial increase of Kern's case rates. Uh, Mr. Alsop had requested that the state reconsider uh, the artificial increase. Again, it looks like you guys are asking uh, for that again this week. I was just wondering if you've heard anything back from the state uh, regarding those requests so far. Austin, no, we have not heard anything back. We know that other counties have similar concerns. Uh, the state calls that I'm on, the um, health officers and health directors express similar concerns, but we have had no proposed changes in the metrics that the state's using. Thank you. Uh, many business owners are obviously frustrated with the economic restrictions that are being imposed by the state. Uh, I was wondering if a large amount of businesses were to decide that they wanted to open up anyway, we, we've seen a couple already do that, um, and they were to choose to ignore the state's framework, what kind of enforcement could they face? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Austin, we've addressed this question uh, on a number of occasions. It's an important question, of course, but um, the state has enforcement authority. They have ties to many of these businesses. They issue permits. They do inspections. They have a enforcement team that's active throughout the state. Uh, we do get now weekly updates about their activity in counties. So they face potential enforcement from the state. Our approach, of course, is we want to do everything possible to keep those numbers down so that we can get everybody back opened um, appropriately so. So there's, a, you know, again, a lot of work that's being done. The Board of Supervisors has been very active in trying to find ways to improve those metrics. Um, and we know together we're going to get there. You heard the Surgeon General even express a good amount of optimism about where we are going and where we've been. So we're hopeful with continued effort, you know, not to let up, more effort, that we're going to get there and we'll, we'll uh, meet those new tiers and allow more businesses to open. Hopefully that addresses your questions, Austin. Appreciate that. Just one last uh, thing, because we, we've been asking the uh, last couple weeks, if there's any update on, on whether or not you guys might be able to release the ages of people that have died from COVID here locally. Uh, Austin, they're still working on it and they're not able to release that data yet. Okay, thanks guys. Mm -hmm. Okay, our next outlet, um, Jack with Mojave Desert News. Did you have any follow-up questions? Carrie with Valley Public Radio, any follow-up? Yes, I do have one. Um, so earlier on, and you've sort of addressed this indirectly, but you know, earlier on when case rates were much, much higher all across the board, we were really, um, our public health officials in general were really discouraging people from getting tested unless they had symptoms or had no exposure just because there were there was a shortage of so many tests and things. So, and, and the governor himself also, um, you know, was saying this. So do I understand now that really it feels like, especially in the case of Kern County where the testing rates are low, does it really feel like we're now incentivizing healthy people um, or the governor is incentivizing healthy people to go out and get tested? Um, Carrie, I think, sorry, we're trying to figure out who's best positioned to answer your question. Like, let me make sure I've got that right. What you're asking is, um, at one point, there were some officials um, that had said they were encouraging only those who were symptomatic to get tested. In fact, I think there were guidelines that were put out for labs at one point. I think that's what you're getting at. Um, however, now it looks like there's an incentive for those who are asymptomatic to get tested as well. Am I summarizing correctly? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Sorry for that. Uh, we're going to have Kim Hernandez answer your question. Hi, Carrie. Um, yes, you're correct. When there was a, you know, a lot of uh, COVID-19 spread going on in the community throughout the state of California, um, and we were seeing some significant testing delays, and there were some concerns about getting test results back quickly. Uh, we spoke a lot about um, ensuring that people who are symptomatic um, could get tested. And so as that, uh, the number of people out there have gone down and we have increased testing capacity, the turnaround times have improved uh, back to what they were before that 
that um, surge in cases in July, um, we're seeing a wide availability in our community. We have always recommended that anybody who has a concern about COVID-19 be tested. Um, so if they are symptomatic, if they are concerned about an exposure, um, we know there's a lot of anxiety around potential exposures and that testing can um, help bring some of those close contacts uh, peace of mind while they continue their quarantine and they watch for symptoms. And so we continue to encourage anybody who has concerns around COVID-19 to contact their health care provider. They can call us at the health department to, to discuss you know, their situation um, so we can help address that. And that if they have concerns, um, testing is something that is widely available in our community now and may be recommended um, depending on um, what they, they discuss with their health care provider. Okay, so, so you can't speak to whether you know this change in policy and kind of this inflation or, or, or punishment of the testing rates, whether that has kind of changed the incentives for, for people or for county health officials to go and encourage people to get tested. Gary, we're going to have Ryan respond. Kerry, uh, you're, you're hitting on exactly why we're frustrated here. Uh, why I was expressed frustration, why our board's frustrated, uh, expressed frustration last week, why our board of supervisors is frustrated, why our public health team uh, is frustrated. Um, there are mixed messages. Uh, there are differences of opinion between the federal and the state on testing. Um, but I will reiterate what it is we know today. Um, the governor of the state of California is calling the shots on how this state and our counties are responding to COVID-19. And uh, he recently published and announced his blueprint for a safer economy. He's made adjustments to that blueprint, uh, which uh, have, we've, we've talked about. And has, he has added in uh, a requirement for our county uh, to um, test at the state uh, average testing rate. State average testing rate is a little over 200. I think at last look it was 217. We're 150, 160. Uh, because we are not testing at the state average, and again, that is a moving target, uh, right? If everybody starts to test, that testing average goes up, and that's the new, uh, you know, the new benchmark, whatever, wherever that lands. Moving target, uh, which we're also frustrated by. Uh, but he has, he is holding us accountable, uh, penalizing us by artificially increasing our overall case rate numbers, um, because we're not testing at the state average. So um, we're confused. Um, doesn't make a lot of sense. We question the you know, veracity uh, of, uh, of util you know, rolling in uh, overall case rates as a uh, testing rates, I'm sorry, as a metric. And uh, continues to be a source of our frustration, which is why our board is uh, calling on uh, the governor to uh, to make some changes and get it addressed. Okay, thank you. Uh, just going back to channel 29, Emily, any follow-up questions? Yeah, so, um, okay, a couple things, a couple things. So I, I just want to make it very, I want to be really clear that the county feels like our current daily new case rate is accurate and that the, the state's inflation is not accurate of what is actually going on in the community. And is there any concern that if everybody starts to get tested, let's say multiple times, are there any concerns that maybe these testing sites might get overwhelmed? So your first statement is absolutely correct. Um, your second question about concern regarding the capacity of our testing sites. Uh, our testing sites currently have a considerable amount of capacity and we have 
several of them throughout the county uh, that are free as well as uh, all of the CVS uh, locations and all of the urgent cares and those through your regular medical provider. Uh, and behind that, there was a lot of work done uh, to make sure that we had the capacity to respond to increased testing back when those numbers were so high. So the concern is not the capacity, the concern is getting people out to get tested. Got it. One more thing. Um, has there been any talk with the, um, the California Association of Counties about, I don't know, maybe some concerted effort on behalf of counties who feel trapped by some of these moving metrics to have a group effort to get the governor to, you know, change some of these things. Yes, there are ongoing conversations with CSAC uh, from all of those counties who are affected by this, and those are typically represented at the Capitol uh, by CSAC, and those those will continue to happen. Got it. Okay, our next uh, outlet, Channel 17, Aton, did you have any follow-up questions? Hey, Megan, uh, yes, just uh, one question. Uh, up for I believe Matt Constantine uh, at the Board of Supervisors on Tuesday and a week ago today uh, Mr. Constantine expressed uh, uh, some positive news some good news it seems for our hospitals ICU um, just checking in to see how that looks as of today uh, our hospital rates uh, and uh, any updates with the school waivers thank you yeah we'll have Matt respond thanks Aton Eitan, uh, yes, so the numbers do change on a daily basis. Uh, this is as of September 15th. Um, our available beds uh, collectively with all of our 10 acute care hospitals is 906. We have uh, 50 available ICU beds collectively. We have uh, 69 uh, COVID hospitalized individuals and 17 ICU COVID hospitalized. Um, so our numbers, although they vary day to day a little bit, they continue to trend down. Our hospitals are healthy. Uh, the curve that we were worried about that Ryan has spoken about earlier continues to flatten. We've been doing a good job at making sure those hospitals remain available for those that are most ill. Uh, and uh, we are hopeful that they will continue to trend downward um, so that we, we can potentially address any uh, increase in the future. Does that address your question? It, indeed it does. Thank you. And uh, any chance that you have an update on school waivers? I believe oh. last week you said that at least 15. I, I don't want to misquote you or anything, but uh, any update on that? Yes, sir. You're correct. I believe we're up to 17 schools. Uh, they do update on our website and on the state's website with more information as those are approved by the county and the state. So that is always the most current information. We do have additional applications coming in. It's, it's an iterative process, so it's always changing, but there continues to be increase from local schools on trying to achieve that waiver. And so far, those that have been submitted and reviewed uh, by us have all been subsequently uh, approved by the state. All right, thanks so much. Our next outlet is KUZD. Rob, did you have any follow-up questions? Okay, uh, the Bakersfield Californian. Sam, any follow-up questions? And then we have an unknown number on the line. Um, so if there's an outlet that we have skipped over um, or we couldn't identify, I'll just pause for a second and give you a chance to weigh in. You are listening to county officials give us an update on the coronavirus crisis in Kern County, specifically talking about the tiers that we fall under. You can continue to watch this on our KGT Facebook page. We're gonna break for golf.